Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And our 2034 season in Oakland is done. Uh, the good news is we made the playoffs for the fifth time in six seasons, uh, had a 90-win season, and we've got our career record over 500 with the A's now, despite uh, having the lowest budget in baseball for each and every of the past 11 seasons that we have been GM of this team. Uh, the bad news is that uh, after a great middle of the season, the team really hit the skids in September uh, with a brutal performance in September, and that carried over to the playoffs where we were swept out in a wild card series, two games to none, by the Kansas City Royals which uh, marks the earliest playoff exit we've ever had in our five trips to the playoffs with this team. So as we start thinking about this upcoming offseason, uh, we're going to do our annual roster review in this episode and start at a very high level uh, discussing our plan for next year. As I mentioned, we were a 90-win team this past season two games above Pythagorean expectations. I mentioned that we were a very good team in the middle of the season from May through August and then absolutely fell apart in September going 8-19 and 19, and ultimately uh, giving up the lead in the division and giving up a record that would have had us with a first round bye if we had uh, kept playing at the pace that we had played over the first five months of the season. Somewhat familiar position for this team, uh, a middle-of-the-pack team, lower middle-of-the-pack team, quite honestly, ranking 11th in runs scored this year, and a very good pitching team, uh, ranking 2nd in runs allowed in the top 5 in every pitching category in the American League, except for walks where we were 11th, and the best defensive efficiency and zone rating in the American League as well, so Excellent pitching and defense combined with a mediocre offense added up to a 90-win team for us. We're going to be losing some significant players off of the squad this upcoming offseason. And with arbitration eligible players, and more importantly than that, uh, in what we're going to be dealing with this offseason, just some players who we've secured to longer-term contracts, getting bumps in those contracts this year. Even with the uh, expected departures of a few key free agents, our spending is going to be about what it is this year, next season. So we're not going to necessarily have a ton of flexibility to be real significant players in free agency this year. Clearly, whatever happens with our budget, this offseason will have a big impact on that. We've gotten modest bumps for the last few seasons in a row. We are all but certain to lose money this year, uh, so that could work against us in terms of our budget for next season. We uh, used some of the excess money that we picked up through trades to sign an impossible-to-sign guy that we picked in the third round, which will hopefully bolster our farm system over time. But in doing so, uh, we still spent money. Uh, so ultimately, we're going to be uh, perhaps penalized for that when we find out what our budget is next year because uh, we are going to lose money for the first time in several seasons this year. We needed a very long playoff run to have any chance of being profitable this year. And uh, as we talked about, Unfortunately, that did not occur. Because I don't think we're going to be huge players in free agency this year, uh, one of the things that I've started to do is scout some players who might be trade targets for us. As I start getting some updated scouting reports on those guys, I'll share those with you later in this episode. Uh, these are typically the kind of guys that I try to land 
right at the start of free agency and trades, typically when the off season begins. Um, I'll sim forward a couple days, work out a bunch of trades, and then come back with another episode. And the types of guys that I'll be sharing with you later in this episode that we're trying to get updated scouting reports on are potential trade targets. I have a feeling most of them are going to be relatively expensive for us to bring on board. I can't figure out exactly how expensive right now because with the playoffs still going on and being past the trade deadline, we can't actually make a trade. So I don't know how realistic some of these targets are, but they're generally players in their mid-20s, two to three years of experience, aren't making a ton of money yet, and they happen to be pretty popular players, given that we're not going to be big players in free agency this year. And I'm worried that our budget could get cut this off season since we're going to lose money. I'm going to do everything possible to try to continue improving our fan interest and hopefully making trades for a couple of guys this off season will help us do that. Also, as I look at our 40 man roster, I feel like particularly with position players, we've got a lot of good players fighting for likely 13 position player spots on our team. And hopefully some of those excess everyday players, whether they're catchers, corner outfield types, or other, may enable us to pull off a trade for somebody who's more popular and perhaps a slightly better player. So big picture, that is kind of what we are thinking about right now. Turning to our pitching staff, and you can see we've still got our three-man starting rotation that we had put in place for the failed attempt in the playoffs against the Royals here. Uh, Mike Lambert's a guy we brought on in a trade with Tampa about a year ago. 7-6 and six record, 318 ERA. Looks like he could be a nice, respectable starting pitcher for us the next couple years. Gives us a second left-hander to pair with Jackson Ferris in the rotation. Still going to be making the major league minimum next year, uh, as he's only got one year, 105 days of service. His price uh, starts getting a little higher after that, so he's not someone we're necessarily looking to make a long-term commitment to right now. Probably let him uh, continue playing out his minimum in arbitration years, and if there's a chance to get him at a discount at some point, think about it. But right now, uh, going year to year with him. Jackson Ferris, uh, the biggest ticket item on our team after we re-upped with him for five years, $110 million this past offseason. He has been our ace uh, ever since we traded with the Giants for him almost six years ago at this point. 12 and 11 this year, uh, the ERA did balloon to 420 and the war went down to 2.6. So not necessarily a ton of value generated given that he's a highly paid guy at this time, but you can see he has been a consistent uh, 11, 12, 13 game, 14 game winner for us over the years. He's had a winning record all six of his seasons with us. This 420 ERA that he had this year at the age of 30 was the highest in his career, at least his career in Oakland. Uh, but if we look at his Sierra for the season, his 2.69 ERA or more accurately, Sierra, was uh, one of the best he's ever had. But the BABIP that he allowed this year was uh, the lowest of his career. So there's things that tell me when I look at the Sierra that maybe he was better than he looked this year. But when I look at his BABIP, uh, maybe he even got lucky to have that 420 ERA this year. Regardless, he'll be back next year at the top of our rotation in all likelihood. Jason DeCaro will also be back. Uh, Right-handed pitcher went 10 and 6 with a 3.91 ERA. He's been a good, solid, respectable pitcher for us over the years. Has that captain personality that we like, and is still signed for uh, another couple of seasons before some of those higher-priced team options 
potentially kick in in his early 30s. Since we're still looking at our playoff roster, um, I will pivot to a fourth potential starting pitcher for us next year, and that's Jamie DeVore. He was going to be our game one starter in a potential ALDS matchup, which is why we uh, didn't have him on the roster for the wildcard series. He's also a Jason DeCaro type, good solid right-handed pitcher. Um, he's in his arbitration years, set to make about $6 million next year, so starting to get expensive for what he is. 8-10 and 10 this year with a 3.90 ERA. He's put up a 2.5 war for us each of his seasons with us at this point. Likely we'll bring him back this coming off season at that $6 million number. Uh, whether or not he's with us for the long term is definitely uncertain. Caden Dana is a guy who uh, started for us a few times a uh, couple years ago. And he did get a start on the final day of the season when we were uh, trying to set up our rotation for the failed Kansas City series. Uh, seven and two record this year, four saves, 364 ERA, over 96 and a third innings pitched. He's a solid, respectable middle reliever. He is a guy that we signed to a longer term contract, going to be making $4 million next year before some team options at the same number kick in. He conceivably could end up back in the rotation for us next year because one guy we will likely be moving on from is Mason Miller, who got off to an awful start this year, then was the best pitcher in baseball for much of the summer, and then along with the rest of our team, really crashed and burned in the month of September. Ultimately uh, had some forearm tendonitis uh, with about a week left in the season, which ended his season, kept him from making the playoffs, or the playoff roster. He ended up 12-12 and with an ERA of just over 5 this season, a 1.6 war. But his stuff and his velocity have both really declined even this year. Um, you can see in January he was still hitting triple digits with 65 stuff. He was throwing in the high 90s most of this season with 60 stuff. But uh, he's now in the mid 90s. His stuff is still a bit above average. But at 36 years old, the fact that he's looking for $6.8 million a year over three years probably means that he's pitched his last game in Oakland. I think we got nice value out of him. He had a seven-year, $50 million deal that was somewhat front-loaded, had a team option for $5 million this year. And he's had a uh, respectable career with us in Oakland. He's been the only guy who's been around all 11 years of this playthrough, even though he missed all of 2025 with an injury. He's the last original Oakland A on this team from when we took it over. 93-92 and 92 record with 9.6 strikeouts per nine innings and an ERA of just under four with a 21.4 war in his Oakland career. So he has been a good, solid starting pitcher for us throughout this playthrough. But I think that uh, Mason Miller has likely thrown his last pitch for the Oakland A's. A couple other pitchers we'll talk about before we get back into the bullpen. Uh, Luke Little was our rental closer this year before a torn triceps ended his season on August 19th. Did a nice job for us with a 266 ERA over 47 and a third innings pitched. Looking for $13.6 million a year over four years, given that he's 34 years old, coming off an injury, and most importantly, our belief that we're not going to have a ton of money to play with this offseason. I tend to think we let Mr. Little move on as well. One guy who will be back is Ted Johnston. Uh, he suffered a partially torn labrum in late July, just a couple of weeks after he was named to the All-Star team. 
Finished the year 5-1 and one with a 285 ERA over 72 and two-thirds innings. Was a good, solid middle reliever for us. He'll be back next year, still making the major league minimum, and hopefully uh, he'll be fully recovered from that partially torn labrum and ready to contribute as a uh, middle reliever for us who could be in the mix to try to earn that fifth starting spot in our rotation. And I guess while we're talking about the injured guys, might as well mention Jaheim Pennyman, uh, former second overall pick, had made it to the majors finally for the first time briefly this year. Unfortunately, he suffered a torn flexor tendon in late July, and he's still going to be out for another 12 months, so he is likely going to miss all of next year. Likely going to be 26 years old before he throws another pitch. Uh, he was 1-1 one one with an ERA of over 5 for us in Oakland, so he certainly wasn't impressive in the small opportunity that he did get this year. His control has just never really developed the way that we hoped it would. Still has a fulsome arsenal of six pitches, uh, some real positive personality traits, good movement on his pitches, but uh, who knows what he's going to look like after this injury. We'll see what he looks like in spring training 2036. Maybe he'll be able to compete for a spot in the back end of our rotation, but certainly not what we hoped in a best-case scenario when we picked him number two overall six and a half years ago. In turning to our bullpen, uh, after the injury to Little, Jeremy Scholl, who was a first-time All-Star for us this year, uh, eighth round pick that's come up through our organization seven and four with seven saves this year uh, 25 shutdowns compared to 10 meltdowns 222 ERA and a one and a half war had a good solid season for us and we recently signed him to a modest extension that will keep him as a uh, arm possibly as our closer most likely in a setup or back end of the bullpen kind of role Levi Sterling, really crazy year for him. Led the American League with 80 games pitched and 19 holds. 7-11 and 11 record with 11 saves. He was our stopper at times and ended up being pushed back into a setup role given that he pitched his way to a 454 ERA and gave up a sickly 22 home runs and 125 innings pitched. He ended up being slightly above, slightly below replacement level on the year. Still really like his stuff and his movement and control are both fine. Um, giving up the home runs is always going to be an issue for him. And he did have a sickly 23 meltdowns on the season. But he's a guy who I think is going to be an important member of our bullpen next year. Another guy who we've already signed to a long-term extension could also be in the mix to be a fifth starter for us next year. Chris Carl, uh, left-handed reliever, another uh, high school player, 11th round draft pick in 2027 who's come up through our organization. 243 ERA over 59 and a third innings. He's had ERAs uh, in the two and a half range in both of his years in the majors. And we've just made a offer to him to try to uh, hopefully ensure that he's a important member of our bullpen for years to come. Uh, the lefty throws in the high 90s. Uh, envision him probably more as a setup man than a closer, but he's looking for a relatively modest contract similar to the contract that we uh, have signed Shoal and Sterling to. So Carl may be locked up in the not too distant future. Another lefty in our pen, R.J. Cope, uh, has had another solid season for us. He was a third-round pick of ours in 2026. So although we've missed on uh, some of the top pitchers that we've taken right near the top of the draft, our uh, high-volume approach to high school pitchers has finally started to pay some dividends at the major league level. 
good solid year for Cope. He also is a very occasional two-way player. Uh, six at-bats this year, went one for six, did drive in a couple of runs. Uh, he's got the ability to occasionally hit a ball out of the ballpark, although he's actually not all that great at making contact. So uh, he's certainly not in any of our regular lineups, but a few times a year when guys are banged up or we get into an extra inning game where we need a random pitch hitter, uh, Cope gets a little bit of action. We already talked about Caden Dana as a uh, potential starter for next year. Rodolfo Quintanilla, eighth round draft pick from 2028, made his major league debut this year. 368 ERA with 27 strikeouts and just one homer allowed in 22 innings. Uh, so would think that he will certainly be in the mix to be a right-handed arm out of our bullpen again next year. Ian Outh, uh, same situation. A solid year is a right-handed reliever, not someone who uh, is likely to be on our team once he starts making significant money. But for the time being, he's another productive right-handed arm out of our bullpen. Uh, one guy who won't likely be back next year is Luis Heal. Uh, traded for him from the Mets right before the deadline. And uh, he put up an ERA of just under four and 22 and two-thirds innings pitched. Uh, did a fine job for us, but he's 36 years old. And he is uh, looking for about $4 million a year for three years, given that we've got so many decent young left and right-handed relievers already on the team. And we've got between Lambert, Ferris, DeCaro, Sterling, Dana, Johnston, and others, uh, certainly options for the starting rotation. I think it's pretty unlikely that Luis Heal will be back with us next year. So before we take a look at our uh, position players, we will uh, find out who's going to be moving on in the league championship series. As we noted at the end of the last episode, uh, the Royals haven't lost a game in the playoffs yet, and they've taken a 2 to nothing lead over the defending World Series champion Rangers, while the Dodgers have a one nothing lead on the Reds in the NLCS. And Chris Carl has signed that contract that uh, we mentioned with him give you the details here. Five years, $15.5 million. Uh, he was set to start making um, more than the major league minimum um, the season after next. So we're basically buying out um, one potential free agency year, but getting um, cost certainty over the next few years at what I think is a pretty reasonable amount if he continues to be a uh, good left-handed reliever with an ERA in the mid-twos. And Dave Ackley, a uh, young catcher, was uh, a unanimous winner of the Pacific Coast League Most Valuable Player Award. We talked about him a lot uh, a couple episodes ago. Fifth round draft pick in 2028, who has just kind of persisted in our organization and uh, exploded in AAA this year, hitting 351 with 42 homers and 107 ribbies. Was respectable in a cup of coffee in the month of September. And looking at his bat and his potential glove, uh, it's hard to imagine that he's not going to be on the major league roster for us uh, as a catcher next season. Durable as far as his injury proneness. He's already looking for pretty decent money. Uh, you can see nine years, $60 million, uh, but a bigger number um, in some of those out years in his 30s. It's not potentially a horrible contract um something i'll have to give some thought to because if he really is a durable solid good but not great defensive catcher with potentially 60 contacts 60 home run power and an average eye there's definitely some value there Looking for more money than a lot of these young guys that we try to sign to longer-term extensions, but 
he very well may be deserving of it. Uh, taking a look at the playoff tree, the Royals have finally dropped a game this postseason, but they still have taken out the defending champs in five, and the Dodgers will be trying to do the same thing to the Reds tomorrow. And the Dodgers did end up uh, taking out the Reds in five games. So uh, the 100-win Royals, the wildcard Royals, because the only team with more wins than them was their division rival, White Sox, will be taking on the NL West division-winning Los Angeles Dodgers in the 2034 World Series. So turning now to the review of our position players, uh, we already talked about Dave Ackley, who we think could be a pretty important catcher go for us going forward, and uh, another young catcher who we picked in the draft the year before, Jaden Boakai, after a rough rookie year, had a really nice season for us, uh, hit 265 with a 92 WRC+, plus, a war of close to two. He's a bit better defensively, but we don't think the bat is quite as good. Uh, Boakai is also a guy who's um, not looking for a cheap number if we talk an extension with him. Eight years, $69 million. So given that it looks like Ackley is looking for a bit less money than Boakai, even though he's not as proven, Ackley might be the one to try to sign now. Keep in mind uh, that we do still also have in the mix Byron Brain, who came up briefly this year. He's not as good defensively, uh, but a left-handed bat who can strike out a lot and hit some home runs for us. He had 46 homers and 102 ribbies with a 248 batting average in AAA um, and was really effective in a small sample size with two homers and two doubles in 14 at-bats at the major league level. Not as good defensively as these other guys, uh, but still a pretty solid player. And then Chris Laughlin, who we traded for last offseason, he hit 244 as our backup catcher, was a bit above replacement, solid defensively. He had the worst year offensively of his uh, three-year major league career with us. But I mentioned we're going to be looking to maybe pair some players off of the 40-man roster. And I feel like at the catcher position, we've got a lot of strength with the four guys that we've just talked about. And they all happen to be in their early to mid-20s as well. So we may be able to use a, a catcher or two as some trade bait when we try to bring somebody on board who can one, help our team on the field, but perhaps just as importantly, hopefully help uh, te help our team at the uh, ticket window and in the stands. A big name that we'll be moving on from this past or this upcoming offseason is likely Brian Ramos. Uh, had a really nice year for us. He's been a year and a half rental. He was also a brief rental for us in 2032 uh, before he signed a contract with Houston and then we traded for him. Hit 245, but had 30 doubles, 30 homers, almost 100 ribbies, 113 WRC plus, a 2.3 war. He is popular, so it could hurt a bit to lose him. But he's looking for four years at over $20 million a year. He's going to be 33 before next season starts. He's fragile physically. And as I mentioned, we've got a lot of right-handed hitting, first base, DH, corner outfield types. I don't think anyone we have is as good as Ramos, but with the money he's looking for and our financial constraints, I think we likely move on from him. If we do move on from Ramos, uh, Kevin Stubblefield could finally get a more significant role at the major league level. He had his worst year in the majors for us this year with an 80 WRC plus, hit just 239, and was below replacement level. Take a look at his major league stats with us over these past three years, and um, he's gotten less and less productive with more and more experience which isn't positive, but 
he has absolutely nothing left to prove in AAA, even though he has uh, spent time in Las Vegas each of the last four years. He is a guy that we uh, signed to a relatively modest medium-term contract a couple of years ago. Probably gets the first crack at being our everyday first baseman. If we're going to be moving on from Ramos. But he is not a perfect player. And he's somebody, if there is some trade value... I could see us dangling him as trade bait. Julio Del Campo, second base when we picked up in the Bertrand Albright in trade with Seattle right at the start of the year. Had a lot of injury issues this year. Hit 292 and 120 at bats in AAA and 279 and 61 at bats at the major league level. He's a guy who still has an option year left next year. Good defender. The bat's not embarrassing. Decent speed. Should be in the mix to be a utility infielder for us next season. Can say the same thing about Sergio Estrada, who's been our starting second baseman most of the last couple years. Finished third in the rookie voting a year ago, but a definite sophomore slump this year with just a 65 WRC+. Plus. The bat and the speed are respectable, similar to Del Campo. A versatile, solid defender, similar to Del Campo. Switch hitter, still making the major league minimum. Uh, certainly see Estrada in the mix for us as a middle infielder next year. Colt Keith is an interesting case for us. Um, still one of our top offensive players, hit 280 this year. 39 doubles, 28 homers, 93 ribbies. 132 WRC plus and a war of close to four. He'll be making 18 million next year, but you may remember uh, we had to sign him to a five year deal to get him signed, and we couldn't include any team options in the deal to get him signed and to get the money to where he needed it to be. We've got potential 25 and 26 million figures at the end of this contract, so. He'll probably be back with us next year at $18 million, but he is a guy that we might look to move on from after that. Unfortunately, he does have 10 and 5 rights now, and he's not currently willing to waive his no-trade clause. Still a very productive offensive player for us, and we've been able to keep him healthy. But he could be going into his final go-round with us, but he'll have something to say about that. Isreber Stewart, uh, right-handed, corner infield type, hit 245, uh, five homers and 26 ribbies and 220 at-bats, 87 WRC+, plus, barely above replacement level, another pretty generic right-handed hitter that if uh, including him in a deal this offseason helps get a deal done, probably wouldn't have a problem doing that. One guy who uh, will certainly be with us next year, though, is Andy Toribio. The durable young shortstop is uh, likely going to win AL Rookie of the Year. Hit 283, 39 doubles, 6 triples, 16 homers, stole 19 bases, put up a 117 WRC plus with a war of close to 5. Taking a look at his fielding at shortstop, uh, 8.7 zone rating. One spot 038 defensive efficiency, um, so a bit above average in terms of those metrics. The 962 fielding percentage, yeah, you can argue that it could be a little bit higher, but he did a respectable job for us at shortstop. He's a guy who we signed to a long term contract that looks like it could be an absolute steal for us uh, a year ago before he had really proven anything. Um, this could end up being a huge asset to us going forward because uh, if he keeps putting up five war, these numbers are incredibly reasonable for us. And uh, looking at his offensive profile, looking at his durability, looking at his defense, um, the hope is he's going to be a pretty important player for us for several years to come. One other guy in the mix is a middle infielder, is another guy we recently signed to an extension 
Alejandro Landin, IAFA signing from seven and a half years ago, number 53 prospect in baseball, made his major league debut this year, good in the clubhouse, solid and versatile defensively, the bat looks respectable, only hit 217 in his first 129 major league at-bats, so just a 76 WRC+. plus. Um, we had to sign him for a bit more money than uh, we paid to Rebio with that contract that we said could be a fantastic one. But Landine probably is penciled in at the starting second base spot right now over Del Campo and Estrada. But there will definitely be a uh, open competition for that position in spring training next year. And before we find out who ends up winning the World Series this year, uh, we've got to take a look at our outfielders. And honestly, I think the situation with the outfield is kind of similar to what we saw at catcher and some of the infield positions where we've probably got more guys than we really need. And at the back end of the roster, there's decent, solid major league players. But if we can use some of our potential surplus to bring on a real popular player who happens to be a little bit better. That could be our approach in the trade market when the offseason does begin. Left fielder Juan Acevedo is a guy that we signed out of the, in, uh, the independent leagues this past offseason for $2 million. Competent-ish left-handed hitter who's nice defensively he was good in triple a with 19 doubles nine homers and a 125 wrc plus and 204 at bats wasn't that good in oakland though with a 70 wrc plus he'll be making two million next year could be an obvious guy for us to potentially try to trade away if he's got a little bit of trade value because uh, probably have some similar players who are still making the major league minimum in the mix. Bob Day is a right-handed hitter um, who's similar. Not as good defensively, but a similar type bat. He was really good in AAA this year and was kind of meh at the major league level. 89 WRC plus and 151 at-bats, but only one homer and seven ribbies. Certainly not what you want from a corner outfielder. Um, fragile physically, and he has intellectual limits. Um, I don't know what they're trying to say there, but it's probably not good. Was below replacement level at the major league level. He's a guy that came up through our organization. We traded him away. Houston waived him at the start of this year. We picked him back up, and um, he could definitely be trade bait this offseason too, although I'm not sure how much value he's really going to have at this point. Luis Tavares, another right-handed hitting, generic corner outfield type. He was basically a league average offensive player for us this year. 13 homers and 42 ribbies and 263 at-bats, but he didn't walk a ton, hit just 247, and was a little below replacement level given his uh, average-ish defense and average-ish speed. It's hard to imagine Acevedo, Day, and Tavares all being back with us next year, and it's conceivable that... Uh, I guess it's conceivable that none of them end up with us next year, but realistically you would think one of them probably makes the team. I'd say in a perfect world, it's most likely Tavares. Luis Lara, our young time center, our longtime center fielder, is uh, going to be turning 30 soon. He's now wrecked physically. Hit just 220 this year in 386 at-bats. So his WRC plus dipped back to 76, which was where it was a couple years ago after he had a bit of a resurgence offensively last year. Still put up a two war as he is an extremely talented defensive player who is also very efficient on the base paths. 
probably penciled in still as our starting defensive center fielder, um, given his great defensive skill there. But don't think he's a guy that we can count on regularly, given his wrecked injury proneness. He's also getting towards the final years of that contract that we signed him to, which was a great contract for a few years and is now still, for a two-war player, a good contract. But would love if he uh, could hit a little more effectively than he has in recent years. Um, he's a 250 career hitter still, but he has been uh, below that each of the last three years. Bobby Cabral, where to begin, where to begin? Uh, Cabral, another guy that we signed to an extension, and uh, given some of his limitations, this is an extension, while it's not going to be a disaster for us, based on the way he performed this year, um, could be a contract we'd be willing to try to get off the books. Love his ability to hit home runs. He's solid defensively, good influence in the clubhouse, but he struggles to hit the ball, and he strikes out an insane amount of times. Ended up being an extremely frustrating season for him. Hit just 177 with 16 homers and 47 ribbies. Um, he's a guy who his first two years with us averaged over 40 homers and over 100 ribbies. So uh, really inexplicably for his age 27 season, just uh, was a disaster and ended up with just a 54 WRC plus two wins below replacement level. He's a free swinger, and if he's a uh, you know free swinger putting up the numbers that he did his first couple years with us, where he's putting up close to a win and a half of value, despite the strikeouts and the low batting averages, we're fine with that. But this past season was obviously a disaster. And he'll probably be back with us next year. But if uh, someone comes knocking on our door with a trade offer for Cabral, we'd certainly be willing to listen. And probably the only player in our entire organization who we would not listen to a trade offer on is Jake Ortega, third overall pick in 2029. Uh, 2028 was a uh, rough year for us, and we ended up picking right near the top of the draft. Uh, since then, we've only missed the playoffs once. But we did take advantage of one of our final really high picks to bring Ortega on board out of Oregon State. And uh, his development has just been incredible. Uh, made his second all-star team this year. He was Rookie of the Year in 2032, Wild Card Series MVP a year ago. A really nice hitting profile, a really nice speed profile, and a really nice defensive profile. The only thing you can criticize him for is... Uh, He's fragile, and he's not that loyal. Fortunately, as far as the loyalty, uh, we locked him up uh, when he had just a handful of major league at-bats, and uh, he is potentially under our team control through his age 32 season at amounts that will be a huge benefit for us if he produces like he did this year. Because uh, we think Jake Ortega is going to be a strong contender for the American League MVP this year. Hit 346, which was second in the league. 99 runs scored and 105 ribbies. Over 200 hits. Led the American League with 52 doubles. Also hit six triples and a career-high 25 home runs. Career-high 34 stolen bases. OPS of over 1,000 and a 173 WRC plus. And oh yeah, he led the American League with a nine and a half war. So uh, Ortega has definitely been uh, the most successful draft pick that we've made throughout this playthrough. 
and the hope is he will continue to be a huge contributor to what we're trying to do here in Oakland for many years to come. He could conceivably take over as our everyday center fielder if we trade away Lara or if Lara has injury issues or if we decide to move Lara into more of a defensive substitute utility outfielder role. Ortega did play all three positions this year. Uh, he was our starting center regularly against left-handed pitching and then when Lara was banged up. So he did play 65 games or start 65 games in center, started 78 in left and started 10 in right. And he was an above average defensive outfielder in terms of his zone rating and defensive efficiency at all three of those positions. And we've also got a fair number of uh, other players who spent time with us in AAA this year that haven't quite made it to the majors. Um, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, we kind of got more everyday players who fit that profile than pitchers who are going to be in AAA next year. But we'll be talking about some of those guys um, when we do our annual review of our farm system, which will likely be coming up in the next episode. Um, but essentially with some of those guys who are in the double and triple A levels for us, that also gives us uh, a little more organizational depth if we do find some trade opportunities that we like in the next few weeks once we get to the postseason or to the off season. And the postseason will be over once this World Series between Kansas City and the Dodgers is decided. Kansas City, as we know from our series against them, 100-win team, second in the AL in runs scored, third in runs allowed. Uh, the Dodgers, an 89-win team, but a division champion who were third in the NL in runs scored and sixth in runs against. And the World Series has been a good one so far. Uh, series tied up 2-2. Two to two. Uh, We have finally uh, started to get some of the scouting reports for the type of players that we might want to pick up and trade back. So I'll show you a couple of them. Again, I don't know how expensive some of these guys are going to be. Uh, Jaden Levette is a relief pitcher in the Yankees organization, 28 years old, um, still making the major league minimum. He's been with them for parts of the last three seasons. His uh, mid-threes ERA has been a bit above replacement level. But he's an extremely popular player. And although he was their closer this year with 27 saves, he was certainly not lights out in that role. I don't know how expensive he'll be. There's definitely some options that we're looking at that are likely more expensive than Levette, but there's also some options looking at that are less expensive than Levette. But um, guys who are at least competent to good in terms of their skill sets, relatively young, although Levette at 28 is one of the older guys that we've been looking at, who happen to be popular and might give us a little boost in terms of our attendance are the types of um, players that we're looking at. An example of a position player, Brady Harris. Uh, he would be a pretty big acquisition if we could bring him on board. Right-handed hitting outfielder, set to be making about $9 million next year in arbitration. But very good defensively, coming off of a year where he had 31 homers, 97 ribbies, only a 105 WRC plus as he hit 239, struck out 191 times. I tend to think that the price for a guy like him is going to be pretty high with the difficult trade settings that we do use. But he is another guy who um, is extremely popular. He's angry because the Nationals are bad here a decade after they're bad in real life. I tend to think the price for him will be prohibitive, but uh, would love to bring somebody like him on board if we could use, for example, one of our corner outfielders who's not quite as good. 
one of our excess catchers and who knows, maybe another prospect or two to get a deal for a guy like him done. I'd love to do that. Um, tend to think Washington might be looking for more than that. And uh, before we do find out who wins the World Series, um, do want to talk about one other player that we hadn't talked about because he wasn't on our uh, playoff roster, and that's Elliot Bonello, who we made a uh, big trade for with Cleveland last offseason. And Bonello had a serious injury with us, a rotator cuff injury, uh, missed a good chunk of the year, and he was pretty horrible while he was playing for us, hitting just 208 and 192 at-bats. His 48 WRC plus was even worse than what we got from Bobby Cabral. We like his personality. We like his defense. Um, he's still a lefty hitting corner outfielder making the major league minimum. But he's another guy who um, at this point I don't think has a guaranteed spot on our major league team next year even though we did uh invest some resources bringing him on board but if we could use a guy like Bonello with some other more valuable assets to get a guy like Harris on board I think we would do that in a second but again can't really see at this point since we are still uh past the trade deadline and in the postseason exactly how costly some of these players that we're scouting are. But uh, very popular guys in their mid to late 20s who are average to good major leaguers are the kind of guys that uh, we're likely to be looking for in the trade market. And we've made it to the month of November. Uh, Kansas City has a 3-2 to two lead over the Dodgers as they uh, get ready for Game 6. Um, we've gotten scouting reports now on the rest of the guys we're scouting out. I'll show Alfredo Guerrero because this is kind of the lowest end guy that we're looking at. You can see he's basically a league average type pitcher, a 26-year-old guy who was actually claimed on waivers um, from Minnesota this past offseason. But he's a fan favorite, um, extremely popular at the major league level. He's been a below average pitcher over the course of his career. I guess that's not completely fair. His ERA plus is a bit above average, but his FIP minus is a bit below average. But he's put up a one war over three seasons in the majors. He's a guy who was just waived before this past offseason. Unfortunately, we... Um, didn't notice him being available then. He is a guy who could actually be a borderline starter, and he has uh, started the occasional game. He's not an extremely talented guy, so I think he's probably someone we could get in a trade for a pretty reasonable amount. I'd love if we could come away with a better pitcher than Guerrero in the trade market, but if uh, the prices for some of the other pitchers we're looking at are crazy, Guerrero's the type of guy who I think I would bring on board largely just because he's so popular and uh, have him as the seventh or eighth arm out of our bullpen who could start a random game for us in a pinch. And the Dodgers won game six in Kansas City, three to two. So we are going to a deciding game seven today to determine uh, whether Kansas City or the Dodgers will be your 2034 World Series champions. And the Dodgers come back from a 3-2 to two deficit to take out the Royals four games to three in the World Series. Jackson Chorio is your 2034 World Series MVP. So after Kansas City dropped just one game in three rounds against American League foes, including our A's, the Dodgers proved to be the best in baseball in 2034. And we've made it to the offseason. Uh, development facilities are open, so we'll be giving that some serious thought between now and the next episode. Arbitration underway. Uh, not going to be a Huge issue for us this year. Jamie DeVore, who we talked about, is our only arbitration-eligible player for us. Is uh, 
we've got a lot of young guys on the team and then we've got a few veterans signed to long-term deals and we've signed a fair number of our younger players to medium-term contracts as well little miller and ramos all pending free agents that we could submit qos to ramos maybe we roll the dice on submitting a qualifying offer to him 19.25 million a year for four years i think i'm inclined to roll the dice and give him one even though we really probably don't want him back given the money he's looking for miller currently looking for the uh actually looking for a lot less he was saying 6.8 million for us now he's saying four million a year over three years um out of loyalty i'm tempted to keep him on the team but we talked earlier about his velocity and his stuff have really started to go over the past uh eight or nine months and uh at the age of soon to be uh, or already 36 um he'll be turning 37 next year uh generally those things don't get better with age especially in the late 30s luke little 14.6 million over four years i just think that's probably an area that we can't really play in for a closer right now um off season underway as we noted we don't have any of the top prospects in baseball as far as the top 10 but we'll talk about that uh next episode already got a trade offer from the phillies who they're looking for shiloh solis who's one of our top prospects ranked number 67 now and they're willing to give us uh first baseman luis buccio no thank you Bench coach Ruben Lardizabal has retired, uh, so we will be, have a spot to fill on our Major League coaching staff this offseason. We'll have to decide whether we want to promote from within or hire someone. Season review goal. Um, wow. Uh, Mr. Fisher uh, is getting used to our success. We won 90 games once again with the smallest budget in baseball made the playoffs for a fifth time in six years and uh he's not happy with how this season went uh he is pleased we signed jackson ferris to an extension not thrilled with our farm system he is happy with our draft record a lot of that going to be driven by jake ortega fan interest remains a problem We've talked about the fact that we're looking at uh, potential popular players in trade rather than free agency this year. And he wants us to bring a uh, championship next year, upgrade at second base, acquire an MVP, build a top six minor league system. Not all of these are just for next year. Increase fan interest and uh, build a dynasty in the next four seasons. And he is going to bump us up to $174 million to let us try to do that. So I guess that's a small amount of progress. Actually, that's a pretty good bump for us, which uh, is good given that we did lose money last year. But even with that bump to $174 million for next year, uh, we are going to remain the lowest budget in baseball. But we're closing the gap on the Pirates. We're only $6 million away uh, there's only six teams with budgets of $200 million or less. So uh, we're within sniffing distance of the Pirates. Maybe we get past them next year. Uh, but the $174 million that we have is still uh, less than half of what teams like the Dodgers, Yankees, Mets, and even the Phillies have to spend. Um, and almost exactly half of what our division rival, the Rangers, have to spend. So uh, still not necessarily a great financial position for us, but it is what it is. And uh, we will take a look at our farm system and um, 
start really moving ahead in this off season in the next episode. Uh, as I talked about, I may actually move ahead a couple days between now and then if I can uh, maybe track down some trades. We'll try to do that. And I'll also uh, report back in next episode in addition to any trades that we do and uh, our annual review of our farm system. Uh, we'll also certainly... Be sure to let you know what we decide to do in the development lab this off season as well. So uh, another year is officially in the books here. Kind of a harsh analysis to me, not only by um, what ownership had to say, but quite honestly, even with the game score. Um, 90 win season um, back in the playoffs and uh, 482 seems a little harsh since uh, that's a lower score than we got when we were 75 and 87 almost a decade ago but it is what it is and we've got to be better next season but I uh, feel like the A's situation has definitely stabilized uh, we've started getting a little bit more money to spend every year we've become a pretty regular playoff team. Uh, the big goal now is to figure out how we can add a uh, second World Series championship into our trophy case with these Oakland A's. And we will start trying to make some progress towards that in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.